Hello, and welcome to Channel 20. We're going to be showing you another edition of Meet the Author today, and today I'm excited about um, visiting with a Chester County resident, um, Maddie Dalrymple, um, who is um, writing suspense novels, and she is beginning a series um, with the heroine being Anne Kinnear, who has very special gifts. Welcome, Maddie. Thank you. It is nice of you to come and take time out of your busy day. We appreciate Happy it. To do it. So, on your bio, it says you live in Chester County, which is very exciting because your book, the one that I read, Sense of Death, which is the one we're going to be talking about today, takes place in Chester County. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm new to Pennsylvania, so I'm so excited that even I know where some of these places are that it was like, oh, yeah, yeah I know what that is. So, anyway, I know you're married and you vacation in Maine and you have two Dalmatians and your husband's a pilot, and you've been playing around trying to be a pilot also. Yes. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself before we talk about the book. Okay, well, as, uh, as you said, I'm from Chester County myself, lived in Westchester for many years, and uh, uh, recently moved to Downingtown, um, and uh, figured that I would do the write what you know. So as you said, a lot of the first book is based in Chester County, um, and also surrounding areas. A lot of it takes place in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. uh, Wilmington, uh, the Hotel DuPont, um, some of the places I call out, but some of them I, um, I've changed the name a little bit. And so uh -huh. sometimes people in the area enjoy reading them and trying to guess what the uh, actual um, location oh. is that it's based on. But, oh, uh, that probably would be fun, but I was just too much of a novice here to even yeah. have known that. So <laughs> maybe the book club, if we can read you at our book club, we'll I would know love how to, to do, do that. that. But what made you start writing? Because you don't, that's not your primary career. Right. I, uh, I write in my spare time. Um, I, uh, I think I had the idea of being a writer because my father wrote. My father uh -huh. um, wrote short stories back in the 50s. He got some uh, stories published in Collier's Weekly and Cosmopolitan. Oh, wow. And um, he wrote under the name William Kingsfield, which is the name I took when I published my books. The name of my publisher is William Kingsfield Publishers, so that's kind of an homage to my father. Um, uh -huh. But, uh, you know, the whole idea of having a story and being able to share it with people was really attractive to me. But, uh, and I did a little bit of writing. Um, I got a couple of uh, stories published when I was in college, but mm -hmm. then I sort of uh, let it go for a long time. And then um, a couple of, uh, in like 2011, I guess, my husband and I were vacationing in Yellowstone. We were at the Yellowstone Hotel, which is uh, a fabulous old hotel in mm -hmm. the park. And um, I had this scene in my head that I was describing to him that was very much like a movie scene. It was you know, one of those things that as I would, you know, fall asleep at night, sometimes I would think about this scene. And I said, you know, it, it feels like a movie, but I'm not really interested in doing a movie. And he said, well, you know, make it into a book. Right. And so that scene became the first, um, unfortunately not the first scene of The Sense of Death, but the, the first scene I wrote. Um, it was a scene where um, the main character, Anne Kinnear, is, um, is a woman who has uh, the ability to sense spirits. And at the beginning of The Sense of Death, it's a very basic um, ability. She can only sort of sense when um, a spirit is present and kind of sense what the uh, demeanor of the spirit is, whether it's, it's friendly or not. She has a sort of consulting business that her brother manages for her surrounding that. And the scene I had in my mind was um, Anne going to a a house on a, on a business engagement, the person had asked to find out if the house was haunted and she arrives and the aura that the house is giving off is so malevolent that she can't even go in. And the reader knows that it was in fact the site of a murder that took place. And at the time I, I was picturing this scene, uh, it was in San Francisco. But um, by the time I wrote the book, it was uh, in Rittenhouse Square. <laughs> so uh, I, I moved it to closer grounds, um, and then I built the book around that. Yeah. Uh, I had to, it turned out to be a very inefficient way of writing a book because I had to write all the scenes that led up to that scene. That scene's mm -hmm. probably halfway through the book. And then I had to write all the scenes that led away from that to a satisfying conclusion. And so, you know, I'd write some of the beginning part, and then I'd think, Oh, that's not really working, and then I have to rework it. So uh, it took me about two and a half years to write the first one because yeah. I was going out about it in that sort of inefficient way. Um, but I finally got it all pulled together. And during that time, I also took a suspense writing class with Mary Jones, who's another um, local Philadelphia area author. She's a member oh. of the Liars Club. 
um, got a lot of great tips from her. Um, and so that's how the first book came about. So the suspense then came from this kind of dream, or had you always thought that suspense would be your um, genre? Um, I th it came from the scene. Oh, yeah. Like, I didn't go into it thinking that I specifically wanted to write a suspense mm -hmm. book. I went into it more thinking that um, I wanted to tell the story, and then when I was done, I had to sort of pick what genre, genre it was. Oh, okay. It was, yeah. Well, you, you did very well. It was very interesting. I was wondering mm -hmm. how you were going to get her at that house mm -hmm. because that wasn't what her business was all about and you did a very good job of getting her there I'm very impressed yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, but anyway um, and so the recurring heroine mm -hmm. is that something that li that you like is to write about one person all the time you um, think? or will I you venture off into other I am actually venturing off. The, the first two books are both featuring Anne, mm -hmm. and um, I wrote the first one not really having an idea in mind of whether I was going to do a, a standalone or a series. Mm -hmm. And then I got done, and I, I really liked the characters. They had all mm -hmm. become sort of like friends yeah. to me, and that's one of the reasons that I really like doing book clubs is there's nothing more fun than sitting around with a bunch of people who also think of these people as, as, yeah. as friends. Um, and there were a couple of characters in particular, in addition to Anne, that I thought, oh, there's you know, really still like some story here to tell. Yeah. So from a creative point of view, um, that was why it expanded into a series. And um, from, a, from a publishing point of view, um, series in general are much more successful than standalone books. Oh, that's interesting. Because I think everybody likes to read a book in the hopes that they'll really like the first one. And mm -hmm. then they'll have two or three or four, four more, more right. um, to read. So that's true. Yeah. I'm going to be picking up uh, the Ann Kinnear series again, but the, the book I'm working on now it is actually, it's either the, the beginning of a second series or it's going to be a standalone, and that's more of okay. a thriller than a suspense Ooh. novel. Okay. Well, we'll have to go much of the fine tunes of the thriller versus suspense. I'm, uh -huh. not, I'm not that knowledgeable. But anyway, I'm glad you say that because um, you're right. Anne, as a child, was so happy and outgoing, and she really liked her gift. Mm -hmm. And then... As an adult, she seemed kind of depressed and unhappy, and I was mm -hmm. wondering, what a poor lady, what's going to happen to her? Why mm -hmm. is she in this business? And I'm assuming that your second book kind of maybe picks up on that, or just yes. a little bit? Well, in the, the, um, I think that Anne, as a child, just takes her skill for granted. Yeah. And it isn't until she starts you know, suffering the consequences of ha being teased by her classmates mm -hmm. or having her parents be worried that you know, she seems to have a, an imaginary friend, but seems very real to her, mm -hmm. um, and that only her, her younger brother really believes what she's saying. And so I think that just as she becomes an adult, she's trained by society to think of it as something that, um, you know, either people think she's lying mm -hmm. or she's um, crazy. <laughs> yes. And, um, but it's a skill that can really help people out. So there are a couple of stories in there about, um, in business engagements she has with her clients uh, to, to, I think, sort of highlight why she sticks with it, even though mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult for her. But then um, things happen in the first book that start making her feel really conflicted about it. Yeah. And in the second book, she is more serious about saying, well, maybe this is something I don't want to, I don't oh, want to do anymore. Okay. Maybe this is something that I don't want people talking about when they talk about me. So yeah, it gets I, a little worse before it gets a little better. Okay. <laughs> I felt like, oh, the poor little thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Have you had any experiences yourself? With I have not. I would oh, love to, true. but okay. I have not. My um, my husband has. Really? My husband um, and his family many years ago were in Gettysburg, uh -huh. and if ever you know you're going to go to a haunted place, it's probably Gettysburg. They were out on the battlefield at night, and they were walking away from. Uh, they had gone out to to visit one of the sites, and they were walking back to the car, and my husband felt a hand on his back pushing him along, and he turned around thinking that his father was going to be behind him and there was no one behind him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that just, um, the idea of that I find so appealing. I wish it would happen to, to me, me, but it just hasn't yet. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see what we can do about that for you. Yes. <laughs> so, so now you've named your own publishing company, you said. Yes. So mm -hmm. I, how does this work, this self-publishing thing? I thought you like mm -hmm. went to other little companies that publish things for you and then you marketed it, but that's not true? Um, well, they're really, uh, the publishing world is now sort of divided into um, traditional publishing and independent publishing. And um, some people say self-publishing, and I'll explain why I don't say self-publishing in a moment. But okay. 
I had, uh, when I was finishing up my first book, I started talking to people who had experience in the traditional publishing world and saying to them, oh, well, you know, if you can get this, if you can get the, um, the uh, approval of the publishing company, oh, they must help you with the marketing. Well, well no, not really. Oh, oh well, yeah. you, you know, you must, you know, I ran through all the things that I imagined must be uh, the benefits of, uh -huh. of that, and um, I think that unless you're Stephen King or John Grisham, you're not getting that. It's, uh -huh. it's still very much on the author, um, but you're giving up a lot of control. Mm -hmm. Yes, I heard that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, I wasn't seeing a big upside, mm -hmm. and um, you know, people, I, I think, think that the traditional publishing world is going to guarantee you riches, and that's not true unless you're Stephen King or John Grisham. <laughs> and also, just the timing of it, um, I think that the traditional publishing is tough, both in the sense that it can take a very long time. You know, you can get your book accepted, and then maybe you have to wait 18 months or two years for it to actually get out there, which mm. I think would be crazy. Or um, your publisher is asking for books on a very aggressive schedule. Mm -hmm. So they may, um, you may give them a book they love it, and they say, oh, that's great, can you give me three more in 18 months? <laughs> and so neither, none of those things were appealing to me. Yeah, I can see that. And so I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to publish uh, independently. Uh -huh. And I like to say independently because um, I think that suggests that you're going about it like a business. Yes. Okay. Um, whereas self-publishing, I think, ha sort of carries the stigma that, um, you know, you get real drunk on a Friday night, and on Monday you can, everybody can buy your college diaries on Amazon. <laughs> and so... Um, you know, with independent publishing, I think there's there's a acknowledgement that you need a professional book cover designer, you need a professional editor, you need a uh -huh. professional proofreader, um, but you're you as the business owner are being able to make the decisions. Yeah, the business cool. owner and, and the creative force behind it are being able to make the decisions right. about that. That's excellent. That's a great description. Thank you. So, but then who actually? Publishes? Oh, who actually who publishes? Does it? it? I mean, you're out there. Well, Amazon is probably the leading. Um, source for self uh, independently Independent. published books. See, I'm I sorry. Fell into it myself. Um, so they have a branch called uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP, uh -huh. uh, which you can upload your files to in a certain format for the ebook. Uh -huh. So you can buy my books on Kindle. Um, they have a branch called Create Space, which is print on demand, which uh -huh. means I upload all my files, the, the cover file, the interior, and then they just print it on demand as people order it. So oh, if, cool. if I upload my book and one person buys it, they print one copy. If a million people buy it, they print a million copies, so you don't have to worry about having to warehouse oh, you know, hundreds excellent. of copies of the book. Um, in my opinion, very, very good quality, too. Mm -hmm. I was nervous when I first um, tried that, but mm -hmm. I was really pleased with the effect. And they even now have um, an audiobook arm, and you can buy both my books in audiobook as well. Oh, wow. um, so you don't need an agent or anything? You don't need an agent, no. And um, for people who are just starting out, Amazon is usually the way to go. Um, but I'm also expanding into other platforms like Barnes & Noble, Nook, and mm -hmm. um, Kobo, which is a company in Canada. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can load it to uh, one other um, distributor who then makes it available to many of the other non-Amazon platforms. So mm -hmm. um, in, uh, by, February, by, by the end of February, I'm hoping that both the books will be available across all those different platforms. Wow, that is so exciting. So you... I'm very impressed. You're just a font of information. Maybe <laughs> sometime you can come back and just talk to us about that. But, yeah, I would love to. But we have like just over a minute left. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you would like to tell our viewers? I mean, I know you have a website and probably mm -hmm. you would like to direct us to that. Yes, if anybody is interested in more information, my website is maddiedalrymple.com. So it's um, t with two Y's, M-A-T-T-Y-D-A-L-R-Y-M-P-L-E. Um, people in this area know Clay Dalrymple. You can remember my last name because it's the same as Clay Dalrymple, who I think was a, a pitcher for the Phillies, or catcher for the Phillies, I think. Okay. Um, I also have, I'm starting out a nonfiction platform um, called The Indie Author, also with a Y, uh, I-N-D-Y, which I'm using to start uh, spreading the word about independent publishing. And you can also uh, use those sources to follow my work in my third book, which um, is tentatively called A Mind Diseased, which, as with my other books, is a, a Shakespeare quote, but I think it'll end up being something different because a mind diseased is hard to say. Um, but yeah, it's um, more of a thriller in the sense it's a little more action-oriented oh, okay. than um, sort of psychological suspense-oriented. 
Okay. So I would encourage anyone who has book clubs in the area and who would be interested in reading yes. them. I love visiting book clubs. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, message I would like to send out. Love visiting book clubs. Okay. Well, you'll be in ours, I'm sure. I'll give you a big, we've got two of us here that belong to the same Excellent. book club. So for sure you'll be there. So I am just so excited. You're, uh, I loved your book. You're a, a good author. You write well. You give a lot of descriptive detail, but it doesn't bog it down. It just moved nicely, and the concept was really good. So I would really recommend this book. This is um, a nice author and a nice series, and I can't wait to read the second one. Well, thank you. So thank you, Maddie, and please come again. I would love to. Thank you very much. Okay, so for Sandy Wallenberg and Channel 20, that's it, and uh, make sure that you wait for our next edition of Maddie Dalrymple and her, what's the next book called? Uh, the next, the second the one is second, The Sense of Reckoning. The Sense of Reckoning. Yep. Okay, I think you will like the Anne Kinnear author, I mean, Anne Kinnear um, heroine that you have created. She's, she's very good.